Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorene Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is acclaimed author Sandra Cisneros. Thank you for joining us. I'm always excited to come back here. Thank you, Lorene. Well, you're in Santa Fe because they did an event called Santa Fe Reads, sponsored by Literacy Volunteers of New Mexico, and the whole city was assigned to read your famous book, The House on Mongo Street. Yes. And so you were, you've been to schools, you've been to auditoriums, you've been leading everyone speaking about this book. Let me also show it in Spanish. Sí, La Casa on Mango Street, translated by the uh, famous Mexican writer, Grand Dame of Letters, Elena Poniatowska. Ah, so here we have the double whammy, Spanish and English. Yes. Um, talk to me a little about your background and tell me a little about Mango Street. Well, um, most people know me from that book because it's a book I wrote in my 20s, uh, half a life ago, more than half a life ago. I started it when I was 21, finished it when I was 28, published it when I was 30. And uh, it was written during a time when I felt very powerless to change anyone's life, especially my own. I was a high school teacher, I was a grad student, I was a counselor at a, a university. I had jobs where I was uh, writing from some place where I didn't feel I could make much difference. And especially when I was teaching at uh, high school students who had dropped out of school, I felt very sad about their lives and I, I didn't know how I could change their lives. I started uh, the book when I was in graduate school, as I said, when I was still at university. And, uh, you know, it began as a place remembered, a neighborhood uh, that I was ashamed that I came from. But by the time I finished it, it had turned into a novel because I started manipulating events and putting people that I knew from my present in a neighborhood from my past. So the stories are based on real people. I just, uh, you know, moved them around and like a dollhouse to make the story better. Well, it exploded on the literary scene. Well, it was a, a quiet explosion oh. for me. <laughs> it took about 10 years. <laughs> it exploded for you, but it took a long time for me because, uh, you know, I was a small press writer at first, and it, it took a time. It, it gathered uh, momentum with librarians and teachers who have always been my my. Uh, saints who helped me forward from the beginning. And then a uh, larger publishing house in New York uh, bought it, Random House. And now, I, the explosion you're talking about, yes, now it's an explosion. And, and part of the shrapnel and the fireworks of the explosion were you got the National Endowment for the Arts Awards, the American Book Award, the Frank Doby one of my favorite writers, <laughs> Artist Fellowships. Penn gave you their Best Fiction Award. The Lannan Foundation, the prestigious Lannan Foundation, gave you their Literary Award. Then you got the MacArthur Genius Grant. Yeah, how did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I guess I would say I'm the most astonished. <laughs> well... I I, it's, it, I like to be astonished when the arc of justice goes to the right person. Because well, you, in a way, you put Chicana lit on the map. You, I know that we, we've had great antis, antecedents, but yes. there was something about the voice that you shared in this book that resonated with so many people, the voiceless. Well, you know, when the book just came out, I remember that some Chicano artist had disparaged me and said it wasn't a Chicano book. Um, I guess because it didn't sound like the male writers at the time. And I wrote it, the story I knew. I, I couldn't make it sound like the male writers. That's not who I am. I, I wrote it in a girl's voice, and I wrote it in a poor girl's voice. And I wrote it so that people wouldn't be intimidated when they opened the book. I was really looking to write a book that would welcome, especially people who aren't used to reading. And I think that's why literacy volunteers chose the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Among your other books later, mm -hmm. um, this is Woman Hollering Creek, a wonderful wonderful collection of short stories. Yeah, my story 11 is in that book, and that's one of my greatest hits. 
And uh, you also have two volumes of poetry. This is my Wicked, Wicked Ways. Just reissued with a new cover, and it's an e-book now, too. And Loose Women, one yeah. of my daughter's favorite books. Yeah, me too. Your other novels... Caramello. Caramello. Tell I, me about this. I love that book because it took 10 years to write, so that's my favorite child. And then the most recently I have is Have You Seen Marie? It's a picture book for adults, for people who are in bereavement, uh, but children can understand it too. And then I have a new book coming out this fall, A House of My Own, Stories from My Life. Well, um, let's talk about that. One, just one other thing about Mango Street. Mm-hmm. Over, almost six million copies sold, printed in 20 languages. Your imprint, you know, this, this, the, the, the pond ripples are going far, far yeah. internationally. <laughs> but even in Mango Street, you talk about that you had to have a house. And now your, your new collection of essays is called? A House of My Own. Right. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about houses. You were very famous. Uh, you became a celebrity because of your house in San Antonio, completely well, separate from your writing. Well, infamous and famous. Yes, I know. <laughs> Depending on your point of view. <laughs> so this this color, periwinkle, tell, tell us a story about your... Oh, I just wanted to paint a house, a color I remembered from my childhood. And I live in a historic district, and I, I ran afoul of the law by accident. I didn't really intentionally look for trouble. But what happened in the end was um, uh, my house was considered uh, in historically inaccurate. And uh, I intended to, uh, you know, try to make everyone happy by getting testimonials and doing some oral histories to um, make everyone in the historic review board happy about my choices. But what I found was historical exclusion of Mexican-American houses in a town named San Antonio. So uh, I didn't mean to find this, but this is where my search my search took me. And eventually, you know, uh, it was resolved. Eventually, my house faded, and those houses were deemed uh, historically accurate. But what it did is it changed, it changed the color of the people who serve on that historic review board, because what we became apparent after the big brouhaha with my house was when we talk about history, whose history do we mean? Yes. And that was the big story behind uh, the thread, in you know, the little thread that I pulled and that unraveled the cloth. Yeah. Now, speaking of brouhaha, we have a similar issue, but with brujas. You know that in Santa Fe, the doors and the windows of the old adobes are painted blue because it keeps the witches out. Oh. So we, too, have a historical de- board that decides all these things. One art gallery wanted to paint their doors and windows a more purpley sort of blue. And they said this color does not occur in nature. And they had to scour the world for a vial of sand that was actually a purpley blue. And only then were they allowed to paint their doors and windows oh. this color. Well, I think it's kind of silly because really one one looks at history – History is about so many layers, and uh, you know, it, it's not just this. This moment is history, and that is not. You know, what I found when I was doing my historical research is it's a continuum. You know, and there's all kinds of evolutions. Even the colors that we think are the Santa Fe look, uh, really, in their time, were brighter. Uh, and loud, actually, and glaring. And by the time they got to us, when things get worn down with weather and with sand and rain. So I, it, the history is a continuum. Uh, it's To me, it's like storytelling. Who's telling the story? Which story do we want to tell? Well, you speak a lot about houses. And so you've said that in a way you need, the, you need a house of your own because it's a for, fortress for your creative self and it's a protector of the daydreams that you need yes. to create. Yes. So yeah. where are you living now? What house <laughs> holds those daydreams? I'm right now living in Mexico in the state of Guanajuato in San Miguel, but I haven't found my house yet. I'm renting an apartment, and so I'm really a woman wandering about with one shoe. <laughs> uh-huh. I feel like that, and I picked up my anchors you know, from Texas and I'm searching for my house, that house of my own, the one that is going to be the house 
at this very moment. Uh huh. Well, many blessings. I know you will find such a house, but you have a little small menagerie living with you also. I do. I mean, I heard. <laughs> <laughs> I have five dogs. They're all uh, smaller uh, animals, uh, shorter than my knee. And uh, but you know, you, you when you've got five, you you need a garden. Yes, yes, you do. <laughs> Otherwise, you're walking them like this. Yes, like Ben Hur. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, we had hoped that might you might consider Santa Fe or Corrales. Or I was. Got many fans here who would love to have you. Yeah, here. I was for a time considering New Mexico, but then I read um, Desert America by Ruben Martinez, and I realized, you know, talk about history and stories and who's telling the story. That there's uh, so much, so many wounds from history in New Mexico, there are open wounds, and uh, there's a lot of healing that needs to be created in Mm -hmm. the state. I lived in Albuquerque, so I'm quite aware of issues of New Mexico, and and I decided it's not my history, so I need to find some place where I have deep historical roots, and I'm living in a place where my mother's uh, ancestors are from. Right, the the state of Guanajuato. Yeah, Yeah. and that has open wounds too, but it has a a feeling of of, uh, belonging that I haven't felt anywhere in the universe. Uh, uh. Um, You write very poignantly about your relationship with your dad and how uh, one of the things he really wanted that made him very sad that he wasn't able to do was to leave a house yeah. For each one of your six brothers, Isn't and you were the only crazy? sister. That a man but, would want to leave seven houses to seven children. He was just an upholster. But but <laughs> how lovely is that? Because like you, he also knew what it meant. He did to have a house of your yes. own. Yes, yes. My my father uh, didn't buy us our first home till I was uh, in middle school, and we were seven children, two older than me and four younger, and. My mother was the one that forced him into buying the house, but I guess he got some sense when he was older and thought, wow, I really need to leave a house for each of my kids that will help them get started in life. And when he was sick and dying with cancer, he knew that he wasn't going to fulfill that dream. And he confessed it to me. He didn't tell the others because I was his favorite child. And he said, you know, I wanted to leave, in Spanish, I, I wanted to leave each of you a house and I failed, and he started to cry. It was so moving to see my father crying like that, and and I just couldn't believe it that he wanted to leave each of us a house. At the time of his death, he owned a, his house and a building where he had his upholstery shop. Uh, so, you know, he was doing better than when he started, but he was never going to get to seven houses. And I'm happy to say that he lived long enough to see me buy my first house all by myself with no assistance from him or my mother and just my pet. And to shift the paradigm from you got to marry off the daughter to she made it on her own and well, she bought this house with well, her Well, I have to say, Lorena, not quite on my own because I have my agent. Oh, and yes. And if I didn't have my agent... I wouldn't be here sitting across from you. (laughs) Well, I know her. Susan is an extraordinary woman. She is. You you do have her to thank for many things. My father used to ask every day, I am Ado Susan? Has Susan called? Because she was like the good husband that took care of me. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, no, there's a lot of your own native talent so it's we'll say it was a happy marriage it's still a happy good marriage husband husbanding Susan's, your work Susan's you are the creator still, she's still taking care of me i'm kind of foolish and she's got her feet on the ground and i'm, I'm glad you know she's been with me longer than any boyfriend i have to say yeah. so i always tell young girls you don't need a husband but you need an, an agent, agent. <laughs> yeah you know when you come here you're so generous with your time and your energy i've seen you talking with school children and you work again with literary 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 literacy volunteers to help get uh, English as second language people and other people to learn how to read. Um, I, in some of the school visits I've been, you're, you're sitting with seventh graders and you're talking to them about how important, one of the important things in writing is sleep and yes. your dreams. And you're giving these kids permission. You say, write the story that you cannot share, and every, everyone has those stories. Yes. And you give them permission to, I could, to, to walk in your footsteps, to say, I could do that. I don't, I don't see 
the act of writing as a way to make a living, although sometimes that happens, like in my case. I don't see uh, my teaching writing so that people will be writers. I see my mission as teaching people to write so that they can heal their heart. Because I really do believe that writing is a way of, of uh, balancing the world, of putting the pieces back together. I read uh, this morning a piece from Eduardo Galeano, one of my mentors, and you know he said that he writes to put the pieces back together that church and state divorce. You know, they separate the mind uh, from the heart. And he even writes about and that separation about that. of mind and heart. Exactly. And you ask these children, mm-hmm. these school children, if they would talk to you and ask you questions from their heart, exactly. not from their mind. So they ask you, how did you get your dogs? And they mm-hmm. ask just really <laughs> wonderful questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I wanted them to know that I don't think about the symbols or what it means. They are the ones that think about that when they analyze it. What I do is give myself permission to dream, and it must come from the heart for it to be meaningful to the reader. You also um, talk about, you know, a a young person has studied poetry, but they don't understand the impulse. And you even talked about there might be a story that feels like a knife at your throat. And that's the poem. Yeah. That's the poem. That's right. So I really was just giving them... uh, ways in which they could use writing to transform darkness to light. Because I think we all have this darkness in our heart, these demons. And as I said and always say to young people, you have to transform that darkness to light. Because if you don't transform it, it will transform you. You also visited the Women's Correctional Facility in Grants. I did. And there's a lot of transformational work to be done there. Oh, my. I was uh, in the company of some extraordinary women. I felt very lucky to meet them. Uh, I had never been in a correctional facility in New Mexico. I've been in other places, but not here. And I know how difficult it was for them to be there listening to stories that might break their hearts open that they wanted to cry at moments and how they were holding things in they had so much in their heart I I, I felt gratitude and I felt like they gave me more than I gave them I I went away just on on ether from being in their presence I want to thank uh, Sandra Myers who teaches there who just a holy woman who opened Mm -hmm. the path for me to be there and when you were speaking to the kids, you you said, how do you find your voice? Everyone has a unique voice that is really them. You suggested that they really make a list of 10 things that make them different from everyone of their ethnic group, of their age group, of their gender. What are those 10 things that make you different? Well, you know, when I went to graduate school and was in such discomfort in Iowa, Uh, it forced me to ask myself, what did I know that no one else knew? So that's kind of where the exercise started. I started thinking, well, what do I know that my classmates don't know? And if I wrote from some place where I was the authority, no one could tell me I was wrong. So that helped me to find that exercise that I share when you think about 10 things that make you different from anyone in the room or anyone of your age group or anyone of your profession or anyone of your family, anyone of your church, of your gender. You can go on and on. And when you write from that 10 times 10 times 10 things, you find your voice. Mm -hmm. That's who you are. Even if you had a a twin, there are so many things you know that no one else knows. And you also said we have five senses, and it's easy to write from those because you know how things, although it's very hard to describe how things taste or, you know, what silent sounds like. But you said that there are other senses that you yeah. need to develop. Mm-hmm. You mentioned mood, mood, weight, and yeah. uh, emotion. Emotion, yes. yeah. There's all these different senses that aren't under the five that are still part of creating an environment when you're writing. You want to include those, too and it makes the writing richer. And it is hard to do sense of smell and taste, but not impossible. And you can look for the writers that do them well. I have my own favorite writers who I think do them very, very well. Well, no one does it better than Proust with the taste of the Madeline. And uh, also, don't forget the master Colette. 
She's oh, yes. very good. Yes, yes, yeah. So how much time do you get to spend reading, and how much time do you spend writing? Well, uh, when I come back from coming out on the road and, and speaking to people, that's the opposite of being the writer. So I need a, a, several days to recover from being out in public. I use those days for loafing, because loafing is very important to yeah. creation and to recharging. And so that's when I read or watch movies or indulge in Busby Berkeley films my favorites, you know, crazy <laughs> things like that, that are just uh, a place to to uh, loaf and indulge in loafing. You know, I, I, that restores me. I, I just have all these books uh, by the bedside, and if one doesn't work, I reach for another. And I do it with a sense of entitlement after I've been out on the road. I'm allowed to loaf because this is preparing me to go back to work. Well, also, when you do these book tours, because this has been pretty a like huge a <laughs> bookstore. I mean, book tour with the 25th anniversary of, of yeah, Mongo Street. Yeah. You've been all over. Well, I have, and now this time, just now that I live in Mexico, we line up my visits like bowling pins, so it is, they're like little mini book tours, mm -hmm. and it's overwhelming and exhausting, but I also get things back. Like I said, going to the Women's Correctional Facility, I felt blessed and got light back. Coming here and meeting the extraordinary people that work for literacy volunteers Tears, very kind, generous people, wonderful uh, institution. Uh, I got a lot back from being there. I, I feel as if coming to Santa Fe is always a pleasure for me. Good, good. Um, when you were first getting started, you set up a foundation, the Macondo Foundation, named after um, the Gabriel Garcia Marquez town, yeah, town. that little town. And it was for um, kind of socially engaged writers. That, writers. Yeah. And, and what is the status of that? Because I it see more exists. and more writers. Maconda still exists, but I'm no longer at the helm and I've retreated. It's now under the auspices of the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center in San Antonio, Texas. And you have to be a published writer and have a history of community uh, activism, but you're welcome to inquire and apply. And the members themselves accept uh, I think one or two or three members a year. And they meet uh, once a year as a workshop to help to network and to edit your work. Mm -hmm. um, so you're working on a book of essays now. Well, my new book is just, I just lifted the pen in February. It's done. It'll be well. out in October. I'm working on post-production right now. And that's when, you know, you finish the book. It takes about n nine months after you're done, sometimes a little bit longer or shorter, and you go over all the pages and do the corrections, the postpartum part. That's where I'm at right so now. So which is more difficult, essays or a work of fiction? I think all of it is hard. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Each book gets harder every uh. <laughs> year. I think it gets harder because your standards get raised with each And also book. the expectations people I can't have. think about the expectations. Yeah. If I thought about that, I would never write a syllable. But I know that my expectation is higher. And, I, you know, with every book, I, I hope I become a better writer. I try to read only books that are going to inspire me to want to write and be a better writer. You know, I'm 60 now, so I don't want to waste my time. Uh, I want to read a book that will lead me to my own writing. So that's what I try to focus on now. One of the quotes you said some time ago that I just found so endearing said that you don't like writing, you like having written. Yeah, I do. <laughs> well, I learned that from Jack LaLanne. Remember him? Yes. You know, I once saw him on Johnny Carson's show and he said, you know, I don't like going to the gym. Do you think I like getting up early and leaving a beautiful babe and going to the gym? <laughs> but I like how I look after, you know, and you know, he liked the, how he, how his body changed after he had worked out, and I understood that because I don't like going to my desk. I don't like being locked up for hours. It's like being in in a correctional facility yeah. <laughs> or a convent. I don't really want to have to write that many hours. I'd rather go outside and have a have a a, a mezcal in the jardin or something. But I like afterwards how I feel. I I, I like looking at the work, you know, maybe I don't have the muscles of Jack LaLanne, but my page has the muscles, yeah. you know, and I think, wow, I did that. <laughs> so I, I do like I do like the after, you know, looking at it afterwards. And could you give just a sentence of advice to the struggling writers out there? Well, 
One of the things you have to know that uh, writing takes you through the valley of despair. But you have to know that you're going to have to pass through it, that it's a process, it's not a destination. Hmm. Well, for some people, they're still working on their first novel. 20 years they've been working on I it. I know. It's a thankless, long task. Yeah. <laughs> I know. My heart goes out to you. But just keep moving. All you have to do is, is ask for like a page and a quarter when you sit down. Try to do a page and a quarter. And when you consider that our mothers and fathers had much more difficult challenges than writing a page and a quarter, they had more difficult lives. Most of us had parents who had more difficult lives. Asking for a page and a quarter isn't that much. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. I kind of ask my father's spirit and my mother's to help me. May I do work that honors them? Can I do work of service? May I make you proud? And that helps. One of the things you did to honor your mother, you did that extraordinary altar. Yes, it's at the Smithsonian. <laughs> oh, it is so beautiful for for the Dia, Dia de los Muertos. It's there now, you, yes. Yes, it's just, and I've seen pictures of it. I'd love to see yeah. it, but it was such a labor of love. Well, you know, the story, my, my mom, when she died, I, it took me a little while before I could actually brave creating an altar for her a physical altar, because I've, I've written pieces for her, but to create an altar. I was invited by the National Museum of Mexican Fine Arts to create it. And then um, Te Mariana Nan from the Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque invited me to put the altar up there. And so I had a whole room. And then uh, the Smithsonian History Museum in D.C. allowed me to bring it there. And now it's up until mid-August, I think. And my mom was a big believer in public libraries and mm -hmm. museums. And she loved museums since she was a girl. They're I'm so pleased that my mom is in the same room as the ruby red slippers. Oh, how <laughs> wonderful. Well, I thank you for all you do for museums, for libraries, for students, for inmates, and for us. Thank so you. our guest today is the beloved writer, Sandra Cisneros. I want to remind our audience that you can get the 25th anniversary edition of the House on Mongo Street and uh, collected works and extraordinary books are in Santa Fe has signed copies they of your books. They have signed copies. Dorothy has put aside all these signed copies of the stock so they should run to collected works and support an independent bookseller who's doing the good work. Well, thank you for your good work providing books for those independent booksellers. I hope you come back the next time you're in town. I better come back. I love coming here. Yeah, me too. This is Lorene Mills. You've been watching Report from Santa Fe with our guest, Sandra Cisneros. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.